Hi everyone, so this is my summary for unit 13. So as usual, let me start by bringing up the kind of images that I'm going to talk through. So unit 13 is the first one where I think we really get a sense of, of macroeconomics really, where we're starting to think about the economy on a, on a national scale. Um, and we just introduce some of the kind of key ideas that we want to analyze at this like national scale. So the first thing to discuss is this image here, because it shows us a kind of interesting, uh, but maybe kind of obvious pattern. So the top picture, the top uh, figure is showing us GDP growth uh, and how that's changing over time, right? And what we can see by looking at this is it, it looks quite volatile, right? It is kind of going up and down and kind of changing all the time. There doesn't seem to be a very sort of consistent pattern, like constant GDP, positive GDP growth, constant negative, it's very up and down. And this up and down nature of GDP is what we refer to as the business cycle. Uh, and you can see labeled here, we've got when we've got GDP growth being positive and maybe at like a, a maximum point, we call that kind of the, the business cycle. And then when it falls, we have a trough down here at the bottom where we're kind of we kind of it's it's been GDP growth has been decreasing and then it comes to to like a bottom a minimum it, it kind of le levels out. So this is important when we look at how does this match up with the unemployment, and what we can see kind of quite clearly is when there are points in time where we have really negative GDP growth, they tend to correspond to times when we have really high unemployment which is obviously something that we worry about because high unemployment is bad for the individuals who are unemployed, but also more expensive for the state because it has to pay higher unemployment benefits and just generally bad for you know, society to have lots and lots of people out of work. So this is a kind of, I guess, of the motivation for why are we interested in looking at and understanding GDP because it ties in to some very, very important realities of of life in a country. Now, one just thing to pick out here uh, is that uh, one thing to talk about here is the term recession, because the reason we want to pick it out is because there actually isn't a kind of standard agreed definition of a recession. So you have NBER, this is the National Bureau of Economic Research. They have a, a definition which says a recession is when output is declining. Uh, so that's all that has to happen. Output just has to be falling and it's over once that stops happening. However, there are alternatives. So we've got this one, when the level of output is below its normal level, and that's even if the economy is growing, but if output is below where it normally would be. Now, this one you can see immediately is a much more subjective one because what is the normal level, right? How do we know what that is? Who gets to decide what that is? So saying when we're in a recession, can be tricky because people have, don't necessarily agree what counts as a recession. Uh, so that's just an important thing to bear in mind. Now, the first kind of thing we're going to look at to, I guess, get a bit of a sense of well, why, why might there be a link between unemployment and growth is something this is sort of first to get a sense of like how strong is the link between these two things and, and how much attention should we pay to it? Now, later on, we can kind of come up with a story of why there would be a link. But for now, I'm just going to focus on this one graph over here, the US, because this is actually the country, this is the country where there is the strongest link between unemployment and GDP growth. And so all of these graphs here, the y-axis is the change in the unemployment rate and the x-axis is real GDP growth. And so for the US, We've got this like scatter of different data points for lots of different years. And then what's done is a regression is run, a linear regression is run to try and find a straight line that minimizes the sum of the squared errors, uh, which if you're not too sure about that is, I wouldn't worry too much. We're kind of plotting the straight line that kind of gets closest to all the individual points. And when we plot a straight line, we get an equation. And that's what this is here. And this R squared thing I'll talk about in a second, but this equation right here, so Y, that is our Y axis value, which is unemployment rate or the change in the unemployment rate. 
And then the X here represents what's our value of real GDP growth. And then we've got two numbers. This one in front of the X, in front of our X coordinate, that represents the slope of this line. And then this represents the Y intercept. So what does this regression equation tell us for the US? Well, first, nice simple thing to do is imagine if X was zero, okay? Now, what does that mean? It means that GDP growth is zero. So the economy has stayed exactly the same size. So what does this equation tell us would happen? Well, if GDP growth was zero, that term disappears and we get Y, the change in the unemployment rate is 1.08. So 1.08%. So what this equation tells us is if there's no GDP growth, unemployment will go up by 1.08%. Now let's bring in this second part. So now let's imagine what if we let X the GDP growth be equal to one. So what does that do? Well, what it's gonna do is tell us that the change in the unemployment rate would be that 1.08, but now minus one times minus 0 0.3671. So the change in unemployment rate would still actually be positive. So you still get an increase, but it would be less than when GDP growth was zero. And then if we allow GDP growth to, to go to two, you can see the change in unemployment rate is gonna be minus 0 0.3671 times two plus 1.0827. So what is this number telling us? That number in front of the X is telling us for every 1% increase in GDP growth, the change in the unemployment rate will fall by 0.367%. Uh, keeping in mind though, when GDP growth is zero, we're gonna have like a baseline 1.08% change in unemployment, of increase in unemployment. But that's what this equation is telling us. And this part is like the really crucial part because it's giving us an indication of how important, like how much of an impact does an increase in GDP growth, a 1% increase in GDP growth have on the unemployment rate. And it's saying that if GDP growth goes up by 1%, that's gonna cause the change in unemployment rate to fall by minus 0.367%. So that's what this like Oaken's law is kind of indicating that there is this relationship between the two, GDP growth and change in unemployment. And then this is where we come to the R squared because the R squared here gives us an indication of how well this linear regression actually explains the pattern that we see from the blue, the blue dots from the data. <laughs> And for the US, we can see that this number is, is 0 0.59, so like 0 0.6. And the R squared is always gonna be between zero and one. The closer it is to one, the stronger the correlation is between the two variables. The closer to zero, the weaker the correlation. So for the US, 0 0.6, there's quite a strong correlation between these two things. Now, if I go over to Japan, we see R squared is 0 0.0685 much, much weaker. So in Japan, there doesn't seem to be much of a link between GDP growth and the change in unemployment rate. So what does that tell us? That Oaken's law is maybe not necessarily such a strong law that actually in some countries, it seems to hold really well. There is this link, strong link between GDP growth and change in unemployment, but in some countries, maybe not so strong. Okay, so... Why are we interested in all this? Well, this sums it up really nicely because if there's a fall in output, say a fall in GDP, we imagine that's gonna cause a rise in the unemployment rate and more unemployment, as I've said before, is gonna to lead to a fall in well-being. So from a government perspective, this is something that they want to try and avoid, avoid right? The purpose of a government is to try and improve the well-being of its citizens. So understanding why this might be happening is really important. Now, we're not going to really get a model of this until unit 14, but unit 13 is going to try and give us a starting point to understand why output might be going up or going down. So that then brings us to a really important thing, which is what do we actually mean by GDP? I've been using it a lot, but haven't actually said what it means. And so GDP, gross domestic product, what we refer to as okay, aggregate output, the total amount of output, or as it says here, the output of all producers in a country. So not just one particular region or firm or sector, 
GDP tells us the value, and that's really important, the value, not like the quantity, but the value of all of the output of all the producers in a country. Okay, and that is the nice, simple way to think of it, the value of all the output. But what's also really important is to realize that there are actually quite a few different ways to measure what is that value. In fact, three, three different ways. So you can see here, three ways to estimate GDP. So the first is just to look at, well, the value of all that output, let's just see how much money has been spent. Because if we look at how much money has been spent on the output, we know exactly what the value is. So that's kind of way number one that you can measure GDP. Just look at what is the total amount of spending by households, firms, government, and in fact, residents of other countries on the output being produced in the home economy. And so we'll see this, the, the, out, the spending of residents of other countries, that's what we're going to call exports. Right. So that's way number one of estimating GDP. Look at the total amount of spending on goods produced in the home economy. Way number two is to look at the production side and to look at this, to look at what is the value added by each industry. Okay, now we're going to get a nice example of this in, in a little bit, so I won't go into too much detail here. But what do we mean by that? Well, when a good is being produced, it potentially has to go through several different stages. And what we do is look at what is the value of all of the inputs into one particular stage? And then what's the value of the output that that industry produces? And the difference between those things is what we mean by value added. So like how much kind of monetary value has been added by that particular industry? And what we do then is, for like a particular good, look at the value added at every stage and add it all together. And that as well should give us um, a measure of the value of the output, right? If we're looking at how much value has been added at every stage, that overall then should give us the total value at the end. And then our third way of looking at GDP is the income method, which is I mean, there's a couple of ways to look at this. One, I think, I think the one we're going to look at in the textbook is to consider, well, all of the value added, right? All of the value of the, that value added to the output when it's being produced, that all has to be paid for. And so that all has to be paid for to the people who are doing the work or to the owners of the firms. And so if we look at the income of all those people, right? So the sum of all the income people have received made up of wages going to the workers, the profits going to the owners of the firms, but also incomes of people who are self-employed and also taxes received by the government. So if we add all of that up, okay, the total income that people have received, that then should also be equal to the value of the output as well. So three different ways to look at GDP or to try and estimate what GDP is. Now, I think next thing is, oh, okay. so. This diagram just gives us a nice kind of summary of all of that, which is now very importantly with this diagram, leaving out a couple of very important um, like players in the economy. So in, a, in, this, in this simple model here, we've just got firms and households. That's leaving out the government completely. And also importantly for GDP, it's leaving out kind of foreign countries because foreign countries can purchase some goods produced in the home economy. But ignoring those for a second, what this shows us is like clearly why we can use these three different ways to measure GDP. So the expenditure way, the spending way, we're just looking at all of the money that households are spending and giving to firms, right? Then if we look at firms, we're looking at what's the value that they are adding and the value that they are adding has to be the same as the income that is received by the households, right? So the value that each firm adds when it's producing goods, that needs to be paid for. And so it's paid for in wages to workers or profits to the owners of the firms who, who are also households. Uh, and then also, you know, we can incorporate like taxes going to government, like that's gonna be one, one place that the money will flow. It's not all gonna go to households if we do have a government. But what this shows us really nicely is that these things have to be the same, right? That the value that firms are adding has to then be equal to the income that they are, those firms are paying to households. So that gives us two really similar things. 
And then the households spend and buy that output. So all three of those things, in theory, should be exactly the same. And they should all give us different ways of measuring the same thing, which is what is the value of that output. Now, obviously, something that's left out here uh, is government. And that's why I've written down here like taxes and public services. So we could incorporate into this model, like the idea of taxes that, you know, some of this income is not going to go to the households. Some of it will go in terms of um, direct taxes, like income tax to the government. Um, and obviously some will go as indirect taxes like VAT once the household is actually spending some of the expenditure. But then also the government provides public services like, you know, public schools, hospitals. And so the value of that could be incorporated into this model as well. And the other thing we leave out is foreign countries. And that's where exports and imports come into things. So exports, those, that means a foreign, like foreign, people in a foreign country who are buying goods produced in our home economy. And so that's gonna bring some money in to the country. And that's, that's going to go into our GDP measure because that is domestic output having been purchased and it's not being purchased by people within, within our home economy, but we need to take that into account. We need to take in the money that comes in for domestic goods sold into foreign countries so that we don't you know, basically discount any the value of the output that's sold to foreign countries. We also need to be careful of imports because if some of the expenditure of households is actually not going to domestic firms, but is going and being spent elsewhere, then that is that is money leaving the home economy. And so we need to take that into account, particularly from the expenditure side. If we ignored that, then we wouldn't get a, a good estimate of GDP because then like we would see that some of the expenditure seems to have gone missing. Like, where has it gone? Like we see more income than expenditure. So we got to take into account that some of the expenditure might be going on imports. So those are two important things to keep in mind with this circular flow. We've got like government getting involved. We've got foreign economies getting involved. And we'll see when we kind of get an equation for GDP that this, uh, this is going to be taken into account. These, you know, the effects of kind of foreign economies and the effect of government. So this is the example that I was talking about, which I think gives us a good way of understanding, I think, the three different ways of measuring GDP. So the first paragraph here kind of sums up the, the spending method really simply, which is basically if we have an economy that produces just a single good, right? So the final good produced in this economy is cotton shirts, and those are sold to consumers for $100. So there we go. There's the expenditure, $100. There's our value of GDP. Right. We just look at what is the expenditure on the final product. Now, how could we use the other methods? Well, if we use the kind of production method where we're looking at value added, that's where a couple of more things become important. So we see the final product is sold for $100. And the final product is produced by this shirt industry. Now, they buy the cloth to produce the shirts for $80. And that cloth has been produced by another like previous step, like the cloth industry. And obviously the cloth industry are selling the cloth for $80 and they have bought cotton from the raw cotton industry for $50. So these are our sort of three steps in the chain. We've got the raw cotton industry, okay, who are selling the cotton to the cloth industry. And then the cloth industry are selling it to the shirt industry and then the shirt industry sell it to consumers. So how do we look at the value added? Well, if we start with the raw cotton industry, so the value of their output, and we're imagining they actually don't have any inputs is $50. So we're basically saying that the, what the cotton industry does is adds value of $50, right? a, li a little bit of a simplification there to imagine that there's no inputs, but let's just kind of take it. So the cotton industry added value is $50. Uh, then the cloth industry, what's their value added? Well, they take in something that costs them $50, but then they sell the cloth they produce for $80. So how much value are they adding? The difference between what they have to pay for their inputs and how much their output. So 
80 minus 50, $30. And then we go to the shirt industry. So they are selling their final good for $100. And how much did it cost them to actually, how much their inputs cost? $80. So how much value are they adding? 20. So if we take the three value addeds, so the $50 value added by the cotton industry, the $30 value added by the cloth industry, and the $20 value added by the shirt industry, add them all together and we get to $100, okay? Which is exactly what should happen. And so this is how we could estimate GDP using this value added method, right? You see, same as the spending method. And the final one, which we be really brief on, all of this value added that firms or that each of these industries are adding, that has to be paid for through wages of the workers or profits to the owners of the firms. And if we looked at the incomes of those people, they should also add up to $100 in this simple example. So that's a nice way of looking at our kind of three different ways of, of measuring or estimating GDP. Okay. So just before I go into this bit, I'm going to take a quick pause. Okay, so just picking back up. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is talk about what are the separate components that make up GDP or the, the way that we can uh, think of these like different components of it. So we can see from this table, we've got consumption, government spending, investment, change in inventories and exports and imports. And so I'm just going to talk through what each of these things represents. So consumption, that is just all of the spending by households in an economy. And you can see that when we look at like the US, the Eurozone and China, this is like a really big, big component, particularly in the US of GDP. So it's just kind of private spending on durable, non-durable goods. Government spending. So this is obviously spending by the government and it can be on um, kind of like almost like consumption items, but it can also be on investment spending. And the really, really important thing about this, very important to kind of make sure you're clear on, is transfers, unemployment benefit, what we kind of refer to generally as transfer payments, they are actually not included as part of government spending. And that's because that's when a transfer payment is when the government gives money to a household, and then the household will likely go out and use that for consumption. So if we included that money as part of the government spending, but then it also appeared in consumption, we'd be double counting. So very, very important. Government spending is spending by the government on sort of like consumption items, like goods and services that it's using or investment in like spending on capital goods that it's going to use doesn't incorporate transfer payments. That's really, really important. Now investments, so that is private firms and it's their spending on things like machinery, buildings, what we generally refer to as capital goods. So when we talk about investment in economics, we mean when firms spend money on capital goods. Now, a really crucial part to take into account with investment is this thing called change in inventories. So if a firm has produced some goods, some output, that is then not sold, right? It doesn't get sold. The firm <clears throat> holds onto it, right? Like stores it in a warehouse. We need to count that as part of the firm's investment, because if we don't, if we kind of ignore that, we ignore this unsold output, then our three different measures of GDP are not going to match up because that, that output, if we use our value added method, right, we will be including the value of the output of those unsold goods. But if those goods are unsold, then the expenditure, the spending on goods that are sold, it won't match up, right? And so that's, that's the problem. And that's why we need to add in to our investment figure, the value of goods that are not sold so that things will kind of match up with all of our different estimates of GDP. So that's a really, really crucial, really, really crucial point. Uh, and then we have exports and imports. So exports, that is when foreign economies purchase domestic goods and imports, that is when the domestic economy, domestic you know, households or government purchase foreign goods. So we need to take that into account as well. And these two things often kind of get put together and, and referred to as net exports. So we get um, what that means is like, what's the value of 
what's the net value of money kind of flowing into the country. And so these taken together, C, consumption, G, government spending, I, investment, including change inventories, and then X minus M, these are our different components of GDP. And if we want to figure out what's the percentage change in GDP, so I've skipped past the formula a little bit, let me go back to it, then what we would need to do is look at what's the percentage change in each of those components, but then multiply it by what is the share of that component in overall GDP. So you can see if we want to get the, the total percentage, the overall percentage change in GDP for each component, work out its percentage change and multiply by its share in GDP. And that will give us our percentage change in GDP, which we saw in the earlier tables is what we were looking at with GDP growth rate, right? The GDP growth rate is the percentage change in GDP. Okay. So kind of, I think this is like the final thing on GDP, I think. Um, and it's just us pointing out that it has some shortcomings. Um, so the first is it's a useful way of measuring the size of an economy, but what it doesn't do at all is take into account kind of the impact of all this production in particular on like the environment, right? And this is something that's more and more important and should be, should be taken more, much more seriously is that the production of goods and services is not something that can just go on forever and ever and ever if like, if it is causing degradation to the environment, if it is using up natural resources. And so GDP obviously doesn't take this into account at all. So that's one big issue with it as one big shortcoming. Second, um, much more sort of simple thing, which is if we're looking at GDP, the overall level of output in an economy, that doesn't tell us maybe that much about individuals in that economy, which is why GDP per capita can be something like very important to consider as well, which how do we get that? Well, we simply take the value of GDP and divide by the population of the country. So we get a measure of what is the value of the output per person, or you can think of it as the value of income per person. So sort of like the average income of a person in that country. So I'd say that's not so much a shortcoming of GDP, but just knowing that that's something that would be quite important to consider as well, GDP per capita per person. Um, and then the final thing, even if we have GDP per capita, is that a complete measure of the living standards in a country? Uh, well, no, right? It doesn't tell us anything about the kind of standard of education, healthcare, environment again. And so, like, it is a useful thing, but certainly does not give us a complete story of what's going on in a country and, and particularly the quality of life in a country. So I think, yes, that's the final thing on GDP. And what we now are going to look at is we saw from the very first figure, GDP has these like has these changes. It fluctuates, it goes up and down. Uh, and as a result, if GDP is going up and down, that means the value of the final output and also the value of people's incomes could be going up and down. And those are things that we refer to as like shocks, right? When people's incomes go up and down, we call that a shock. And we imagine that there are two ways that people can or households can prepare themselves for shocks. So the first is self-insurance, uh, which is a fancy way of saying saving, right? So households, just in case you know bad things might happen to them and only them in the future, they stay, they save some of their income so that in a in the bad times, um, they can use some of those savings to basically help. I'm going to use a term we're going to come back to help smooth their consumption, right? So they don't have to dramatically change their, their like way of living. So that's one way they can do it. Savings. Also, it's possible that they could you know, use, make use of borrowing as well to try and, and do that. And so self-insurance is kind of composed of the ability or having saved, but then also being able to use, use borrowing to kind of keep your consumption smooth. Now, coinsurance is when we do this sort of insurance on a much like a larger scale. Now, in the past, um, you know, when there wasn't so much sort of government intervention, 
This would just be the case of maybe like extended families or even friends, neighbors helping each other out. So if one household gets like hit by a bit of bad luck, other households who've maybe been more fortunate could help them out, maybe you know, give them a little bit of food or give them a bit of a loan of money. On in like the more, I guess, modern context, uh, this co-insurance kind of takes the forms of, of, of the tax system, right? So that wealthier people pay tax, which can then be transferred to people on lower incomes. Uh, and it gives a nice example here, people who are out of work, you know, they've hit a bit of bad luck so that their income has, has kind of gone, but they're going to get some unemployment benefit. So co-insurance is when households help each other out and the tax system is, is precisely one example of that. So what do these two types of strategies tell us about people? Well, something I've referred to already, people prefer smooth consumption, right? People would rather not, and this is just something that we see in, in like human behavior and, and kind of the data on household consumption is that people would much prefer to just have a kind of relatively constant level of consumption uh, over their lifetime rather than sort of, you know, being like flush and spending loads of cash today and then really poor tomorrow, that in general, and that's important, in general, people like to have smoother consumption. But the second thing, the fact that we have kind of co-insurance uh, tells us that households aren't completely selfish, right? That if they were completely selfish, then they wouldn't want to give any of their money away to help out their neighbors or their friends or other people in, in the country. Uh, and so that tells us, you know, that the stuff we saw earlier in term one, that there is an element of altruism or reciprocal preferences. People are willing to pay taxes in order to help out people who are less fortunate. So these strategies, self-insurance, co-insurance, tell us about these, these preferences, that people prefer smooth consumption. And we see that because of the self-insurance that people do, saving and borrowing. Uh, and people are not selfish because of the fact that there is co-insurance in the world and people are willing to pay taxes. Okay, so ah, what about though, if we have economy-wide shocks? Well, these are the things like the pandemic, the financial crisis, um, I mean, even the current situation in Ukraine and Russia where self-insurance maybe will still be quite like effective. Um, you know, if you've managed to put some savings away, you might be able to kind of keep smoothing your consumption. But a big point about an economy-wide shock where lots and lots of households are impacted is it makes co-insurance maybe a little bit less effective, right? Because the idea of co-insurance is the people who haven't been hit so badly by some kind of shock can help out the people who have been hit badly. But if everyone's hit badly, then there's no kind of person to kind of step in and help. Um, but I mean, that, that's kind of, I suppose, where it's very, very useful to have a government who can provide, I guess, a kind of co-insurance almost of like last resort that if loads of households are badly hit, think about what happened during the pan pandemic, the government can step in and provide that kind of safety net to make sure people are not like really suffering as a result. But just important to kind of keep in mind, we've got household shocks, things that can affect individual households, and then economy-wide shocks where like all households are hit. So I think what's coming next is so some examples of what we mean by sort of consumption smoothing um, and different strategies that households will, will kind of take. So just before I go on to these, I'm just gonna take a, a quick pause. Okay, so just uh, picking up from where I stopped there. So what we're gonna now go through is a few sorts of diagrams that kind of illustrate some of the things that households will do in response to, to shocks. So here, this idea of consumption smoothing. So what this diagram is trying to show us is in order to kind of smooth consumption over their lifetime, this is like a really simplified model of what a household might do. Um, so you've got the red arrow that shows the path of consumption, the blue that shows the path of their income. And we imagine that when a person starts work, that they're gonna be on a relatively like low level of income. Uh, but in the future, they expect maybe a promotion, which will push their income up. So because they have that expectation, what are they gonna do at the beginning of their working life? 
well, they're actually going to borrow in order to fund a higher level of consumption. And you can imagine like, like in, in, in reality, this, this is kind of exactly what people do in terms of borrowing, like getting a mortgage to buy a house, borrowing maybe to buy a car, because early in their life, they haven't got all the money they need to kind of fund that level of consumption, but they're expecting to have it at some point. And so they borrow to kind of cover that difference. And then, then later in life, they get a promotion, right? They get to that higher level of income. As you can see, they jump up much higher level, much higher path of income. Uh, and during that period of time, they're doing two things. They are accumulating savings because they know later on they're going to stop working. Um, and they're repaying the debt. They're repaying that borrowing that they did. But this allows them to again, keep that same level of consumption that they had in the early part of their working life. Then they retire. And what's interesting here is the income goes down, but not completely because, you know, they're still going to maybe be getting income from a pension, um, but they're maintaining a level of consumption that's higher than their, their kind of income at that time uh, because they've accumulated some savings over their working life. So a really like simple model of how people kind of, keep consumption smooth over the course of their life. They use a bit of borrowing, a bit of saving in order to kind of keep that level of consumption pretty constant. Now, what if they experience a shock? Well, how they're going to respond kind of depends on the type of shock. So we've got like three elements to what are they going to do. So the first thing is they have to make a judgment. They have to make a judgment about whether that shock is something that's going to have a temporary impact on their income or whether it's going to be a permanent one. Now, if it is a permanent shock, if they are imagining that, that their income is now for the rest of their life or for a significant period of their life going to be higher, then they might completely adjust, particularly the path of consumption. And maybe it's going to be a higher now, like smooth level. Or if that shock is a bad shock, maybe a lower smooth level of consumption for the future. But if the shock is temporary, right? So if it's like some small thing, you know, like you won a couple of hundred pounds on the lottery or something, we'd imagine that in that case, the person isn't then going to suddenly drastically change their level of consumption for the rest of their life. Uh, and so it won't make much of a difference. But this makes things sound nice and simple, whether shocks are, are permanent or temporary. Uh, obviously can be a much more complicated thing to, to, to think about. So that's the consumption smoothing. Now we've got three things here, which indicate why consumption smoothing might not be possible for all households. And we're gonna look at uh, why this might be the case again, using some diagrams in a second. So the first is what if the household is credit constrained or credit market excluded? So credit constrained mean their ability to borrow is quite limited, that maybe they can't borrow that much or their borrowing will be at very high interest rates. Credit market excluded, that means they just can't borrow at all, right? Maybe they don't have any collateral or nothing to back up the loan. Then we've got weakness of will. So this is the idea that um, people make a plan, but they struggle to carry it out, which is obviously something that happens to people all of the time. Uh, and we're going to see how maybe that will have an impact on things. And then limited coinsurance. So what if you don't have kind of extended family or you don't live in a country with a very strong welfare system? And so you don't have people who can help you out or mechanisms to help you out when you suffer some sort of negative shock. So I think we're going to start with what if you're credit constrained? All right. So we're going to take. An example, uh, so the, the top and the bottom is kind of a person facing, a household facing the same scenario. Uh, that scenario is that they're going to get some news about an increase in their future income. And then a little bit later on, the income is actually going to go up. So if we have a non-credit constrained household, how are they going to respond? Well, as soon as they get this news and they're pretty confident that like this in their income is going to go up in future, they would immediately jump to a higher level of consumption, a higher level of, say, long run consumption. And they're going to fund that by borrowing because they are really confident that when they get to the point where their income does rise, they are then going to keep that now higher level of consumption 
right? But the income has jumped up above that level. So that difference can be used to repay the debt, can repay the cost of that borrowing from earlier on. So we can see that access to credit has allowed a household to kind of immediately jump up to this higher level of consumption. Whereas if that household is credit constrained, right? It says here consumption constrained, it's a scenario where the household doesn't have access, can't get access to borrowing. Well, they get the news about their future income going up, but they can't do anything, right? Because all they're able to do is just spend whatever income they have. And so those things just stay exactly the same. Path of consumption and income stays the same. And then when the income does rise, then they do get to increase their consumption. But what you see for this person is we don't get that smoothness, right? We just get this like, low level, jump up to the high level. And as we've said, as I said earlier, people prefer smoother consumption over time. So we generally see in like data and evidence on this. So this person who's constrained can't achieve that. Now, I think another way of looking at a like kind of similar, well, I think it's the same sort of idea, and but now bringing in utility into things is this graph right here. So, this is similar to what we saw in unit 10, uh, which is where we've got a household who have to decide between consuming now and consuming later. And we're imagining that the way that they can kind of trade off consumption now or swap between consumption now and later on is through some borrowing. And so our red line here, our feasible frontier, kind of shows us all the possible levels of consumption now and later that can be achieved through some borrowing at interest rate R. So, and then we've got uh, these blue indifference curves. And in this case, obviously indifference curves further away from the origin are higher levels of utility. So we begin with a household initial endowment and pattern of consumption. So this household gets income equal to Y now and income equal to Y later on. And what they choose to do is consume like Y now and Y later on to keep the same level of consumption now and later. And that allows them to be on the highest possible indifference curve they can get to with this feasible frontier. And actually there's no borrowing involved here, right? They don't have to do anything because they're just gonna consume Y now and later on. They're gonna consume all their income now and later on. Now we imagine this household gets a bit of a shock. So a temporary income shock, which means now, instead of getting income Y, they get this income Y prime. But later on, they will still get income Y. So that's then gonna move them to this point A prime, right? If, if they decided to just consume Y prime now and Y later on, right? They'd be at this point A prime. But we can see that if this household has the ability to borrow, right, and this feasible frontier shows us all of the combinations of consumption they could have now and later on, if they can borrow, we see if they can borrow, actually they would be they would be better off not being at A prime, but being down here at A prime prime, where now they are going to borrow some money now. So that instead of consuming Y prime, they can consume a higher amount C prime. Now that does mean that later on, when they get their income Y, they can't consume all of that because they're gonna have to repay this debt and they're only gonna be able to consume this C prime. But why do they wanna be here? Well, this diagram showing us, this gets them to the highest possible indifference curve given this feasible frontier. And that highest possible indifference curve is where their consumption now is C prime and their consumption later on is C prime. And so this, this diagram is what's illustrating to us is when the household can smooth their consumption, even after this shock, where they still get same consumption now and later on, that gives them the highest level of utility. Whereas if the household can't borrow, they're stuck here, right? And if we imagine drawing an indifference curve uh, going through this point, right, it would be an indifference curve that is certainly lower than the one that they could be on if they can borrow. So this is just another way of, an, of kind of showing or modeling why the ability to borrow can lead to a higher level of utility, 
and being excluded from credit markets or limited in terms of what you can borrow means that your utility is, is also kind of limited and, and lower than it could be if you could borrow. Okay, next thing is just a way of illustrating the idea of weakness of will. So uh, weakness of will, well, we're gonna have a, a similar diagram to one that we saw before where we've got our household that wants a smooth consumption. At this time though, they're gonna get some news about their income in the future falling. So what does the household with like not weakness of will with strength of will do? Well, when they get this news, because they wanna smooth their consumption, they prepare for the fall in income. So between the news and the actual fall in income, they reduce their level of consumption. And while their income's still high, they use that difference between this now lower level of consumption and their still high income, and they save the difference. And that means when their income does fall later on, they're able to maintain a slightly higher level of consumption than their income would allow by using some of those savings that they made earlier on. Or you can see maybe that they could, they could borrow. Now, their ability to borrow, uh, obviously they're gonna have to pay that back at some point. Um, so maybe they're expecting even further in the future, there'll be some increase in their income again. But this is how the consumption smoothing, perfectly strong-willed household would respond. They would immediately reduce their consumption so that they could save, so that they could maintain a slightly higher level of consumption uh, later on. Whereas the household with weakness of will, well, we just see something really simple. Um, they get this news and maybe they want to, they, they want to start saving, but they just can't quite kind of bring themselves to actually do it. They instead, they're just like, well, maybe I'll, I'll start tomorrow. Um, tomorrow I'll start saving. Tomorrow I'll make sure that I've got some money for the future but they just never do it. They can't quite hold themselves to the plan. And so they get the news and they never reduce their level of consumption. So then when their income does actually fall, they're just gonna have to lower their consumption to that new level of income. Uh, and again, no smoothness here, right? Just a sudden jump from a high level to a low level of consumption. And that's what we mean kind of by weakness of will. There's a desire to maybe try and do the the right thing or a desire to try and smooth the consumption, but households just struggle to follow through on, on the, the plan that would uh, allow that to happen. Now, is there one more? Oh no, okay, so I think the last bit of this video is where we're gonna talk through, oh no, it's not the last bit. I'm gonna talk through investment and why investment's quite volatile uh, and then talk about inflation. But before I go into that, again, I'm just gonna take a quick pause. Okay, so just picking back up where I paused. <clears throat> so in the section before, talking about consumption and households, how they like how they can go about smoothing their consumption. Now, just to make the like link really clear, why are we talking about that? Because we saw consumption is one big part of GDP. Um, and so kind of seeing how households might change their consumption in response to shocks might give us some explanation of why GDP. Uh, changes in the way that it does. Now, investment, that's very much to do with firms. And what we see is, and you see this in the data, and we'll look at this in a minute or two, that investment spending by firms is much more volatile, right? That there isn't a sense of kind of smoothing there. It's like very much up and down. And two little ways, two kind of little models we can use to think about why that might be the case. The first is this like cycle here. So let's start at the top. If firms, for some reason, have low expectations of future demand, right? They, for some reason, they imagine that the demand for their output is gonna stay quite low in the future. So what are they gonna do? They are gonna end up then, so low capacity utilization. So the, the capital, the, the, the labor that they have, they're not actually gonna use it to its full ability. And as a result, they're not gonna make very high profits. And, Kind of seeing that they're not using much of their capacity and they're not making very high profits then when it comes to decisions about investment they're going to think well what's the point i mean we're at the moment not making very much money we're not using our full capacity so there doesn't seem to be any reason to actually invest now if they then don't invest don't or it says or hire more people then what does that mean well it means that there's going to be little spending by firms on capital goods 
little spending by firms on investing in their workforce. And as a result, the firms who produce the capital goods won't be making very much money. Workers won't be making very much money. And so there won't be much spending going on. And so there will be <laughs> not very much demand in future. Um, and this cycle can then just carry on and carry on and investment spending just stays low. So that's one way of imagining why if investment spending is kind of low right now, it might stay low in the future. We can imagine actually a tweak to this where actually where if there's high expectations of future demand, this can then go completely opposite way where then investment kind of forces more investment and builds on it and there's a positive feedback. Now, this game theory example is a way of kind of seeing why investment can be seen as what's called a coordination game, where if firms kind of work together in a sense uh, or have some information about what each are going to do, then we, they could end up in a better position. But we're also going to see that if maybe they don't have that information, that actually we end up in a, in a not so good position. So let's just analyze this like we would uh, any kind of uh, payoff matrix. So let's take A's perspective. So if they think that B is going to invest, what should they do? Well, they should invest because that would get them 100. Whereas if they don't, they'd only get a payoff of 80. If they think B is not going to invest, well, what should they do? Uh, they should not invest because they get a payoff of 10 if they don't invest, whereas minus 40 if they do. Now we switch to B's perspective. So if they think A are going to invest, what should they do? Also invest because that'll get them 100 payoff versus 80 if they don't. And if they think A is not going to invest, what should they do? Well, they should not invest because 10 from not investing is bigger, from the, bigger than the minus 40 from investing. So what do we see here? We see that there are two Nash equilibria in this game. One, where both firms decide to invest. One, where both firms decide not to invest. And this is a useful way of kind of seeing or understanding why we might get these patterns in the economy as a whole, where investment kind of jumps up because firms are kind of maybe thinking, well, if everyone's going to invest, the best thing to me to do is invest. And then they see these big payoffs, so then they carry on investing. Whereas if firms think, oh, people are not investing, the best thing for me to do is not invest. And then you see much, much smaller payoffs. And so we get this like negative cycle. So these are just two nice ways of kind of thinking about why investment can be have a sort of like positive feedback where more invest the investment breeds more investment, which breeds more investment, whereas a lack of investment breeds less investment and so on and so on. And this explains the sort of more volatile nature of investment, um, which we can see. We're going to look at some data now. We can see quite clearly in some of this data. Um, I want to zoom in a little bit. Um, Okay, so actually, sorry, this first graph is just showing us maybe the link between businesses' levels of confidence and how much investment they'll do. And you can think of the coordination game here. When businesses are confident about what others are doing, they might be more likely to invest. And so we, we see this industrial confidence indicator, our green line, and then growth of investment. And you can see that, although it's not like a perfect relationship, when confidence grows, investment starts to grow, all right? Um, and also you can see the confidence kind of grows when demand is, is kind of growing. But like you see really strong correlation, particularly like here uh, around the financial crisis where um, you see industrial confidence fall and then investment falls. So there is a real link between the beliefs that people have about the state of the economy and how much they're going to invest. And what these next couple of graphs for the UK and the US show us really nicely is actually these two things, the consumption smoothing and the volatility of investment. So the black line here shows us GDP growth rate, right? So what's happening to GDP? What's, how is it changing over time? And the green line shows us private consumption, consumptions of households. 
And what you can see is that the consumption of households is following the GDP growth really quite closely. And in fact, by quite similar amounts. And that's an indication that households really do kind of smooth their consumption, that they kind of mirror like what's happening in terms of the value of output in terms of GDP with their consumption. Whereas if we look at the red line, the gross investment, you see much bigger spikes and troughs that it's much more volatile. I mean, it also follows what's going on in terms of GDP. When GDP is positive, investment goes positive, And that makes sense. But you see like GDP here is kind of plus, I don't know, 6%, but investment is up near almost 10%. So much more volatile. And we see a similar thing when we look at the US data again. So black line is GDP growth. And you see that the, the green, the personal or the private consumption is following it really, really closely, very, very similar levels. Whereas the red investment, much more volatile. So this like volatile investment, consumption smoothing is something that we see in most countries. However, there's a couple of nice kind of examples of where this is maybe not so true. So if we look at Mexico, here you can actually see in some places there is quite a lot of consumption smoothing, right? The green lines following the, the private consumption line, following the GDP quite closely. Here, though, you see a period where actually, wow, really not. <laughs> really not a lot of consumption smoothing going on here. Uh, and again, we see the pattern of really volatile investment. And South Africa, another example where, again, here you see really volatile investment. Um, and then when it comes to the consumption, the green line, you see there are attempts to smooth, but actually really is a bit volatile as well. And why? how could we explain this? Why are Mexico and South Africa different? Well, you can go back to that, like what might be constraining people from smoothing their consumption. Are people in South Africa and Mexico less able to borrow? Are they more credit constrained or maybe slightly more controversially? Are there more are there are the people in South Africa and Mexico? Maybe there are a greater proportion who are weak willed. Uh, I would say it's probably a bit more on the lack of access to credit that stops people from being able to smooth their consumption. Why do I say that? Because in Mexico and South Africa, higher levels of poverty, higher levels of poverty, lower incomes means it's probably harder to get access to borrowing if that's the case. So I think there's one final section, one final thing to talk about, which is inflation. And just before I get to that, I'm again just going to take a quick pause. Okay, so just finishing off with the last bit here in Unit 13. So this is about inflation, and we'll see kind of in unit 14, I think again, or it might be 15 actually, uh, inflation is something, another really important thing for a government to consider uh, because inflation is looking at what is the change in the sort of general price level. Um, and for a government, they obviously don't want households, consumers to face kind of price levels going up and down and, and like, and firms also kind of experiencing that because it makes it really hard for households to plan, makes it hard for firms to plan because they just don't know how much they're going to have to spend on different things. So here, what we're really just going to focus on is what are a couple of different ways of, of measuring inflation. So we've got the consumer price index. And so the idea of that is to try and get a general level of prices consumers are paying. And so how that's done is the, the kind of body that's that's constructing the consumer price index will select a basket of goods and services and what goes into that basket are goods and services that a typical households will will buy um, and you can see down here some examples of the types of things so like food drink housing clothing transportation recreational activities education and each good or service when it's being, we're kind of getting an average, really is what we want to do, what's like the average price of these things. But we want to do it fairly. And so each good or service is given a weight. And that weight depends on the fraction of household spending that it accounts for. So something like, say, food, which accounts for maybe quite a big amount of household spending, that would be given quite a high weight. Its price would be given quite a big weight in this average calculation. Whereas things that maybe don't account for so much would be given a smaller weight. Uh, and so then like the body that's constructing the consumer price index uh, 
will take these, the price of these particular goods and services and the weight that they assign to each one and use this to essentially work out an average or what's called a weighted average. And that gives us the consumer price index. And then if we look at changes in the consumer price index over time, that's what gives us a measure of inflation. So if the general price level goes up by 1%, that means we have inflation of 1%. Now, really importantly, CPI doesn't include exports, right? Because we're looking at spending of goods and services in our domestic economy, but it does include some imports because some of the things that consumers in the domestic economy are buying could be coming from other countries. So that's an important consideration to keep in mind, particularly when we look at inflation based on the CPI versus inflation based on a different price index, which is called the GDP deflator. So what the GDP deflator does, again, it's a price index, but not produced by looking at a basket of goods. The way that it is constructed is by looking at, as it says here, the price changes of the components of domestic GDP, right? So we've seen this consumption, investment, government spending, exports minus imports. So what we're seeing here is that this price index is built based on what are the prices of private consumption, the price of investment, the price of government spending. And then really importantly here, the X minus M. So this is our net exports, which tells us that we are including, uh, well, it says here we're including exports, but excluding imports. So what I would say is that we're getting net exports here. So we're looking at the kind of price of net exports. Um, and that way you can kind of argue that the GDP deflator doesn't take into account the price of imports because we're sort of subtracting the imports from the exports. So the second way of, of kind of thinking about or another way of thinking about the GDP deflator is it says down here, the ratio of nominal GDP to real GDP. Um, and this, so another price index, another way of kind of getting a sense of what the overall price level is. And I think the most important thing to be aware of with the CPI and the GDP deflator is that CPI does include imports, GDP deflator does not. All right, so that, that's pretty much it. Uh, so that is the end of unit 13. Um, and really, I'd say the main like takeaway message about Unit 13 is it's a, an introduction to some very important concepts that we're now going to try and model in Unit 14, Unit 15, Unit 16, try and understand, you know, where is the like level of demand for all this output coming from? How do we understand that? Like, how can we model like where inflation is coming from? And so that's really what Unit 13 is getting us starting thinking about is how how can we model some of these things on a national scale but uh yeah i hope this video was helpful but i will leave it there